This is problem 1383, it's on page 751. Uh, glycerin at 20 degrees Celsius, 0.3 kilograms per second, is to be heated by ethylene glycol at 60 degrees Celsius, and the same mass flow rate in a thin wall double pipe parallel flow heat exchanger. If the overall heat transfer coefficient is 240 watts per square meter per degree Celsius, and the heat transfer surface area is 7.6 square meters, determine A, the rate of heat transfer, and B, the outlet temperatures of the glycerin and the glycol. All right, now, let me sketch the system. It's a double pipe heat exchanger. So the pipe concentric with a shell, essentially. And ethylene glycol flows in, it's the hot stream that flows in at 60 degrees Celsius at a rate of 0.3 kilograms per second. So there's our mass flow rate on the hot side. Now, I unfortunately have taken up space, but hopefully you get the idea here. There's another fluid that flows in, uh, it's glycerin. Uh, that flows in at a temperature of the cold stream in of 20 degrees Celsius with a mass flow rate on the cold side of the same 0.3 kilograms per second. And the heat capacity on the cold side was given as 2.4 kilojoules uh, per kilogram per degree Celsius. Now the heat capacity on the hot side was given as 2.5 kilojoules per kilogram per degree Celsius. They did not tell us in the problem statement the, the temperature of the hot stream coming out or the temperature of the cold stream coming out. Neither of these were given. They did tell us properties of the heat exchanger. Basically they told us the size of the heat exchanger. The overall heat transfer coefficient is 240 watts per square meter per degree Celsius, the heat transfer surface area is 7.6 square meters. Now, we cannot use the log mean temperature difference method to solve this problem because we don't have the exiting temperatures. We also do not know the overall heat transfer rate, right? We don't know that. There's no way to get it, in fact, in this problem. So, what do we have to do? Well, we have to use the effectiveness number of transfer units method to solve this problem. That's our only option. So our solution is that the heat transfer rate will be equal to the effectiveness multiplied by the maximum heat transfer rate. Now, the maximum heat transfer rate is something we can get at already. It's the minimum capacity rate multiplied by the temperature of the hot stream. Let's do it this way. Temperature of the hot stream coming in. Subscript I, there we go. Less the temperature of the cold stream coming in. In. Okay, that's supposed to be an I there. So we should find out what the minimum capacity rate is. So let's calculate the capacity rate on the hot side and on the cold side. Now since the mass flow rate is the same, it's pretty obvious that whichever one has the lower heat capacity is going to be the minimum capacity rate. So it's pretty obvious that the cold stream side is going to end up being the minimum capacity rate. But let's calculate it. On the cold stream side, I guess I should show you what I'm plugging in, we need the mass flow rate on the cold stream multiplied by the heat capacity on the cold stream side, so that's 0.3 kilograms per second multiplied by the heat capacity of 2.4 kilojoules per kilogram per degree Celsius. So the kilograms go away and the capacity rate on the cold side comes out to 0.72 kilojoules per uh, second per degree Celsius. On the hot stream side, the mass flow rate times the heat capacity is again 0.3 kilograms per second, but now times 2.5 kilojoules per kilogram per degree Celsius. Of course, the kilograms go away again. We'll have the same units, but this is 0.75 kilojoules per second per degree Celsius. So this one's the minimum, right? That's C min, and here is C max. So now we know what goes in here. We know the temperatures. 
Uh, I won't bother plugging them in on the board. I don't see a whole lot of value in that. But if you take 0.72 multiplied by the temperature difference between 60 and 20, in other words by 40, then you find that the maximum heat transfer rate uh, is 28.8 kilowatts. So there's the maximum. That's not the actual heat transfer rate. The actual heat transfer rate will be less than that. So to get the actual heat transfer rate, we need to know the effectiveness. So how can we find the effectiveness? Well, this is where the effectiveness number of transfer units method really shines. If you go to page 792, you'll see that there are equations to give you the effectiveness in terms of the number of transfer units and the capacity ratio. We don't have either one of those things. What are those? Well, the capacity ratio is just C min over C max. Now, it's pretty obvious that it's going to be pretty close to 1. But let's go ahead and calculate it. Uh, it turns out that it's 0 0.96 when you plug these two heat capacity, or excuse me, these two capacity rates into the ratio equation here. It's a non-dimensional thing. It's, as I said, close to 1. The number of transfer units we can also calculate because that's just UA over C min. So U, the overall heat transfer coefficient, was given as 240 watts per square meter per degree Celsius. Uh, a, the area was given as 7.6 square meters, so those two cancel. The minimum capacity rate is 0 0.72 kilojoules per second per degree Celsius. So let's see, degrees Celsius go away, but what about the watts and the kilojoules per second? Well, a kilojoule per second is a kilowatt, so these two don't, don't work together, right? We've got to uh, add a conversion factor. So let's see, there's uh, 1,000 watts per every one kilowatt. A kilowatt is a kilojoule per second. That goes away now. The watts cancel, and everything is okay. So the number of transfer units comes out to 2.5333, and again, this is dimensionless. So now we've got the number of transfer units and the capacity ratio. We're going to use these two things to get at the effectiveness. So again, back to page 729, look at table 13.4, you'll see that we have a double pipe heat exchanger that was given, and it's parallel flow. So the very first equation in the table is the one we need to use. So the effectiveness, let me get rid of, um, you can remember the 28.8 kilowatts, hopefully. So the effectiveness, to calculate it, it's simply 1 minus EXP. Now what the heck is EXP? That's E to the power of. So it's the same way as writing it like this. E to the power of the negative number of transfer units times 1 plus C. Okay? That's what that means in your book, over 1 plus C, where C is the capacity ratio. Okay? So now we can plug all these things in. 1 minus E to the power of negative number of transfer units, 2.5333 times 1 plus C, the capacity ratio, 0 0.96, okay, divided by 1 plus 0 0.96, which is, of course, just 1.96. So if you plug all this into your calculator, you should come up with 0 0.5066. Now you should try this and make sure you can plug numbers into your calculator properly and, and get this result. But there's our effectiveness. So now that we have the effectiveness, it's about 50% effective or so. Multiply that by the 28.8 kilowatts, and you find that the heat transfer rate is 14.59 kilowatts. Now that's one of the things that we were asked to find. However, it would also be nice to have the exiting temperatures. So let's see if we can, can calculate the exiting temperatures now. Uh, now that we've got the actual heat transfer rate. Okay, so the temperature change we can calculate as an energy balance. Basically, the heat transfer rate on the cold side would be equal to the capacity rate on the cold side times the change in temperature on the cold side. So basically, expanding this equation, what that says is that the temperature on the cold side, well, let's see, the cold side comes in at 20. We don't know the temperature coming out. But we do know it comes in at 20, I tell you what, let's use all symbols, temperature of the cold stream in. Notice I've set this up intentionally to make Q dot positive because the temperature of the cold stream out should be higher than the temperature of the cold stream in. And the capacity rate I have to use is the one on the cold side, I don't have a choice there. 
but I already know the heat transfer rate on the cold side is the same as the heat transfer rate on the hot side. It's just queued up. It's just that 14.6 or so kilowatts. So now I can rearrange to solve for the temperature of the cold stream out. That's the unknown in the equation. And it's just the um, uh, heat transfer rate divided by the capacity rate plus the temperature of the cold stream coming in. So Q dot is just 14.59 kilowatts. The capacity rate on the cold side uh, is 0 0.72 kilowatts per degree Celsius and add in the cold stream inlet temperature 20 degrees Celsius and you come up with a temperature of 40.27 degrees Celsius. Okay, so now we know the cold stream exiting temperature, 40.27 degrees Celsius. How about the temperature of the hot stream? Well, the hot stream energy balance is essentially the same thing. Okay. And the temperature of the hot stream out is what we want. Now, we have to be careful here because the hot stream comes out at a lower temperature than it comes in at. Now, I'd like the difference to be positive, so I have to put the hot stream in first and the hot stream out second. So I have to change the order of those two temperatures to keep this positive, okay? making my calculations easier. So solving for the temperature of the hot stream out is a little different now because now we have a negative sign on this. Okay? Now, that may not be real easy to see right off. Uh, well, I have to change my subscripts also. Basically, this ratio, this Q dot over the capacity rate, just tells you how much the temperature changes. We know the temperature drops, so take the temperature of the hot stream in and subtract some temperature off, basically, and you'll have the temperature of the hot stream out. So add a negative sign, the capacity rate on the hot side is 0.75. The hot stream comes in at uh, 60 degrees Celsius. So if we plug all this into our calculator, the exiting temperature on the hot, or the hot side is 40.54 degrees Celsius or so. Now let's do a sanity check and see if this makes sense. Notice that the hot stream is flowing this way, but the cold stream is flowing parallel. Now notice that the hot stream comes out at a slightly higher temperature than the cold stream. That makes sense. It would be impossible for the cold stream to come out at a higher temperature than the hot stream because this is a parallel flow heat exchanger. Now, if we set it up in counter current, we might be able to um, do a better job. And I would challenge you to solve this problem, assuming that you could set up the heat exchanger in counter flow and see what happens. How do the outlet temperatures change? Uh, what occurs? What, what, what is the result?